evening all um let's make a start shall we thanks everyone for joining us um and good evening all from the uk that's awesome uh, so we've got looks like we've got an international audience so great so my name is uh, russell shepherd um i'm uh director of evolution um and uh, on the back of the successful webinar we had last week um uh, where we talked about the uh, the work we're doing for John and converting Land Rovers to uh, electric, um, uh, I, we figured it was a really good antidote to um, you know lockdown, isolation, fever, and all that kind of stuff, um, and and talk about another conversion and one which is actually I've got to say I'm really interested in as well, uh, which is uh, the I think it's a Mark One uh, Ford. Uh, Cortina and uh, that was converted by um, uh, by Tim Harrison up in Queensland so Tim's on the line now I'm based in Melbourne Tim's in Queensland and um, Tim can you hear me are you there yep I can hear you Russ thanks wow. for inviting me that's all right that's all right uh, look I, like I say I'm really interested in, in this as much as uh, as everyone else so I'm excited I'm going to be uh, obviously uh, uh, looking forward to, to go through the slides and, and learn all about this with, with with everyone else as well. So look, uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Obviously, everyone's on mute apart from me and Tim because that would be a nightmare if we had 60 people all talking at the same time. Um, there is a questions box there as well, so pop your questions in there, um, and uh, we'll attempt to ask them or answer them. Or sorry, Tim will as we as we go through. And um, you know, and if we anything we don't cover off, we'll obviously uh, answer at the end as at the end as well. Um, so look, um, I, I guess over to you, Tim, if you'd like to crack on and, and talk through, and I'll move the slides as we go along. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Russ, for inviting me, and and thanks everyone for for joining online. Um, happy to. I'll just be winging it and and talking about the like my everyone car. does, mate. Yep. Yeah. So uh, let's see if we can get through. We'll we'll just I'll just talk through some pictures, and then at the end, hopefully, I have plenty of time for question and answer time. So yeah, yeah. get some answers, questions ready on the on the screen. Yeah. Perfect. Um, um, so I'll get straight to the first slide where it all started, I guess. Yeah. Sure. So this is a picture of uh, my Mark One Cortina. This is a 1965 Mark One Cortina um, as as the day I got it. So it was, it's a, a fairly good body to start with, as you can see. Um, I guess I should go back and, and set the scene. Uh, why did I want to convert a car um, to electric? Well, I've been interested in, in electric cars for a while and I've been interested in classic cars for a while. And I've been working in the field of electric vehicles, mm. working mainly in the electric vehicle charging infrastructure yeah. space. So I've been working previously with Queensland government planning the electric superhighway network of, of fast charges along the east coast of Queensland and most recently for EV networks, which is a, a uh, private company investing in a nationwide ultra fast charging network across Australia. So always been interested in the field um, and I wanted to have a classic car again it had been a few years since i'd had one um because of you know family and getting older and thinking oh i don't think i'll get another classic car these days because mm. it's just too much time and effort and um but i do like the, the idea of a an ev but i so i wanted to combine the two without compromising too much of the good things of, of either one yeah look and i think um I think what's also interesting is when you and obviously um, for those who don't know, obviously evolution has a hand in, in infrastructure as well. And obviously Tim and I do talk on occasion around stuff and things and infrastructure and charges, and all this kind of stuff. And usually 20% of it is around charging and then 80% is around, um, you know, what's he's up, what, he, what, he, what he's up to with the Cortina or what I'm, I'm up to with the, with the Land Rover. So there's always like, obviously that, that interest overriding pretty much most things actually. So it's, it, incredible passion i think there definitely okay um inspiration i guess this is just a picture this isn't all my kids just a couple of them and it just puts it in perspective of you know a car is meant to be fun and and 
this what inspired me to have a, a car that doesn't overtake everything or consume all my spare time. So, you know, maintenance on an old car usually was something that I used to have to spend a lot of my spare time on before I had kids. But now with kids, it's, it's all about trying to get a car that's fun and simple to use. And when the time comes to just hop in the car and drive. So, uh, look, I was inspired by some of the um, great classic cars that have been converted by EV West and electric classic cars. Um, Neil Young's original, you know, classic uh, Lincoln that it was a hybrid electric conversion. All these things um, inspired me to uh, think, why not? Let's give it a go. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so that, why did I choose a Cortina? Well, you can see from this picture, there's, there's acres of space in these things, but yet they're still pretty light um, and relatively small. But, but like the previous picture, it could still fit a few, fair few people in it. So it's still a, a family-sized car, well, relatively small, but um, still heaps of space. And you'll see the space in the engine bay as well. Um, and it's fairly light. You know, it starts at about 850-odd kilos before you straight take anything out of it. So in my eyes, it was a good uh, candidate for conversion. Uh, and knowing a dumb one before, it was a bit different. Um, I liked it because it was a bit different. It wasn't a Beetle or, you know, um, something that everyone else had converted. Uh, it had a bit of style uh, and it was still relatively affordable. Yeah, and, and not a Falcon or a Holden or whatever. So yeah, very different. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, like exactly. Here we go. On top right there, that's the original 1500 cc engine in its place. And then with the engine removed, uh, looking at the original bell housing of the gearbox there that we maintain. And then just a quick mock up of the Hyper 9 motor that was going to go in the engine, the old engine's place. And you can just see that there's still uh tons of room there to, to play with in the in the front engine bay there yeah and is that the original gearbox you've retained there is it yeah that's right so that's the stock four speed manual uh gearbox which we've kept and the stock um drive drive shaft down to the rear diff okay excellent that's really good i guess I the other thing while we're looking at the engine bay um there's no brake booster there's no fancy ECU or complicated electrics there. It's that all lends itself to being a fairly straightforward conversion compared to more modern cars. Yeah, I, I like your, um, well, I was gonna say cardboard aided design there, but that's exactly what we did with Juniper essentially, is we started with, you know, a, a, a mock-up of what we thought would go as the motor and then you put it in place and you work out what can go around it from there. Exactly. Yeah. No, really good, man. Really good. Um, so then, so I, I guess I should say that I started with more um, modest intentions. I had a wrecked Mitsubishi iMuv sitting in my carport and I thought the, the drive train and the specs on, on the iMuv were fairly a fairly good match for the Cortina. And I thought, let's just transplant the battery and the drivetrain from the IMEV into the Cortina. Thought that would be a fairly straightforward thing. It didn't end up being that straightforward. Um, and it ended up being quite a bit of effort. And then I realized that it really wasn't going to be a, as good a conversion as what I had in my mind. Because the IMEV only had a 16 kilowatt hour battery um, and still a fairly complicated set of electrics uh, um, and components attached to it that would make it hard to just swap into a, an old car. So then I started uh, seeing what everyone else was doing around the world and, and it seemed that Tesla, Tesla swaps and Tesla batteries were the way to go. So then I, I picked up this Tesla Model X and thought, okay, let's, let's step it up a notch and do this conversion properly if I'm going to spend the, the time and effort on it. I want to end up with a product that's got the right range and, and the right performance and it fits well with the, the donor body. So we, uh, I picked up this 
wrecked Model X on auction and, and started to strip it out. So this is after taking out some of the, the key uh, body panels, et cetera, but it was fairly well messed up. Um, and yeah, that really, really helped um, solidify the vision for what we were doing. So we, we had realized that I got good batteries. Now I'm going to get a good motor to match and, and really do a, a good conversion. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and of course the question is going to be is, and you don't have to answer, you know, the, the, the price at the time for the, for the uh, Model X, obviously, you know, what, what do you end up paying for that in the end? Yeah, so this is, this is in 2018, this was about 20 grand, um, yeah. I think from what I recall, and, you know, a bit of time and a lot of time and effort, I must say, to strip it down and, and take all the unnecessary bits off and rubbish and, and to get to what we really needed. Um, but in saying that, it did, that 90 kilowatt hour battery was enough to um, go into three classic car conversions, mine and two other VW Beetles. So right. it's, it's, um, it served served well this Model X, even though it had no nothing more to give in its current state. It uh, it was passed on and, and um, to three classic cars that are now on the road. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. utilizing those those packs and and did it drive when you got it as well? No, no. This was was real. It was I think it had three wheels. It was smashed on the other side um, fairly fairly badly and mm. uh, yeah everything had gone off on it and um, yeah it was it was breaking dollies and everything just to get it onto the you know to move it around um, but yeah it was it was the next slide actually shows a bit of the result of and the, and the people that um, were involved yeah okay to give you an idea um, these are some volunteers from the AVA in Bris in Brisbane that I I can't um, mention highly enough for what they do. I, I recognise some of the usual suspects. Yeah, yeah. So these guys, it was really fascinating. Everyone was interested out of you know uh, curiosity to to see how Tesla was put together and how it would come apart. And yeah, yeah it was a great it was a great day. Um, yeah, I just see that question about. HP Power Wars. Yes, it is. And he actually did a video on the day and it's on YouTube, on his YouTube uh, channel. Yeah. A uh, bit of a time lapse of, of the day and how it unfolded with taking that wreck and, and getting those modules out by the end of one day um, with all those guys pitching in. No one had done it before. No one there in the picture. Mm. Um, but we ended up with getting them all out safely at the end of the day. So that was... That was great. So if anyone needs a bit of help or guidance, yeah, don't be afraid to get in contact with your AEVA branch. Yeah, that they're always helpful, a bunch of guys to, you know, uh, with this kind of stuff and that they just want to see things on the road uh, and, and things progressing for sure. And I just, uh, my observation there is um, just how big the pack is. It's like the talk, you know, obviously the Tesla is a big car anyway. Uh, it's wide, especially if you compare it next to another vehicle. But when you see that pack, you can just see the, the just it's just huge huge yeah. thing yeah it is yeah um all right so then um what i uh the next step was realizing that to get a good job done you need to get some professional help with guys that have done it before and, and know how to do a good good clean um execution of of what i wanted and my vision mm -hmm. so i got james at traction ev involved yep. and this is his workshop in the top right there that's his own beetle with the hyper 9 converted and he's holding on to a 3d printed hyper 9 motor there with a custom uh, adapter plate fitted to it which is which is used for you know motor mounting and 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 such um testing and there's a picture of him there getting into the guts of uh testing when we were going through the charter mode charging um, procedure but this is this is who I can uh, thank for doing all the the detail all the technical work and and getting mm. it so nice and neat I think I think the, the result of it is, is obviously awesome because you, you've got you started with a, a body that didn't 
didn't need to be restored, at least didn't seem to be. And then you've got obviously a really good ex execution there, and you know, you know, lovely and neat as, as far as we can see so far. So yeah, really, really well done. It's a good combination. Yeah, going back to that vehicle choice, definitely. I I was thinking about it and looking, thinking about it for years, and it, was, it all came down to getting a a body that's a good good body that doesn't need a lot of restoration, but not necessarily a good runner. I mean, it sounds obvious um, now, yeah. but it's so often people are tempted by something thinking, oh, it only it needs a little bit of body work or, or it's, it's close enough. Um, but having something that was good enough to just roll straight into the workshop for the conversion um, mm -hmm. made a big difference. I mean, it's still a few things that I'm finishing off now in terms of the, the body, but uh, for it to be ready to go straight in for the conversion without too much uh, time or, or effort at the front to, to get the body work into shape really helps. So. Yeah, I, I can actually uh, 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 sympathise or, or, or associate with that. We're actually, we've got a, a white Range Rover two-door in our shop at the moment and um, it's pretty rough and it'll be several weeks before we actually start the conversion simply because the body's so rough and because... There's a whole lot of, you know, it's it's a 40, 50 year old car that needs a whole lot of work before we can actually go and do do the conversion as such. So it's definitely the smart way to go about it um, is to get a car like this that's all, all already been already been done. Um, I, I, what we might do, Tim, is there's actually a fair few questions that have already come up um, as well. Um, I don't know if you can see those yourself there, but we'll just fire a couple at you. So. Um, I think you covered this off, this off, but what did you do in terms of vacuum for the servo brakes or have you got servo assisted brakes at all? Yeah, so there's no 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 assistance on the brakes now that, I mean, factory has front discs and rear drums. Yep. And with the regen braking that we've now got with the electric uh, conversion, you know, the mechanical brakes hardly get used. And I mean, mm -hmm. the regen braking is superb. So. Uh, it pulls up a lot better than it ever did, and that's just just with the regen. So um, yeah, fortunately, didn't have to uh, think about uh, providing vacuum for a servo brake system. Yeah, okay. And look, just to answer that question for those when when you actually need it, in the Land Rover we actually have a vacuum pump with a with a with a, a reservoir as well. So that runs pretty much constantly, and it's it sounds it gives a kind of um, Actually, gives it quite a nice sound. It doubles as a as a, uh, a proximity alert for pedestrians as well. It actually works really well. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely something to consider. Um, uh, another common one here is um, from Brad Sheehan. Uh, why didn't you go for a direct drive? Why retain the gearbox? Yeah, good question. I uh, I wanted to keep a number of reasons why we did. Um, that Hyper Nine motor is is pretty powerful. Little little motor uh, the specs have come up soon but it's probably not big enough to to power a car to get the right um you know acceleration that you want from from off the line all the way to a high speed um in one single uh mm. drive whereas if you keep the gearbox you can you can you basically got a torque multiplier at your control whenever you, you choose to, to use it. I mean, I don't have to use it. I can keep it in second or third uh, all day and start off and, and fire through from zero to over 100 in third or from zero to 80 odd in second. So you can keep it in second all around suburban drives and or keep it in third all for um, highway speeds. But having that, torque multiplier at your control gives it that manual um, uh, dexterity and, and control that you you associate with these cars so it kind yeah. of keeps that analog feel but if you don't want to mess around with it you don't have to so the hyper 9 is really best suited for mating to a manual gearbox um, yeah and, and look i think what other people don't realize is that it is possible for these motors to stall as well so uh, obviously not stalling as in a petrol as you're into we would think of it as a petrol um, engine but 
um, it's possible for them not to turn or gear if you it's too high at all if it's too high if it's too much of a taller gear then it's possible for them not to move off the line at all you know if it's on a hill or whatever so it, yeah it's it, a reduction gearbox and or um, a, a, a a gear box that you've already got is something you need for these type of conversions typically is what I find anyway. Um, uh, okay, we'll answer some of the, we'll come back to some of the other, other questions as well. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Um, let's move on to the next one. Yeah. Okay, so my vision for, for the, the converted car was to, like I already said, try and keep the, the look and, and feel of the classic car as much as possible, but just make everything about it reliable and fun to drive and quick and modern, but try and keep most of those modern things hidden as much as possible if, if that was um, possible. So the interior is fairly stock. Um, I kept all the analog gauges as much as possible. Um, and no no major surgery in the in the body of the car it's totally reversible if 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 that needs to be done at some stage uh, i just added air conditioning so that it's comfortable in queensland weather added the re regenerative braking so that it, it helps pull it up uh, much better than it ever did and look tried to get the right balance between um, performance upgrades but without needing without worrying the engineer too much and what I mean by that is not adding too much extra weight keeping the the, the front rear balance um, weight balance fairly similar to stock and mm. and just follow you know using all the original um, engine mounts uh, and points where where things originally were so I didn't have to upgrade the suspension or or brakes or anything to satisfy the engineer yeah, and, and that's and that's what we did. That's kind of our our, our 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 secret, I guess, really, with our open secret with the Land Rovers as well. We we keep the power. Um, it obviously a slight increase on power, but the weight is broadly the same. Um, might be a hundred kilos more here or there, but it's it's no more than what it was. A no, not much more than it was originally. Um, and obviously, the from an engineer's point of view, they concentrate on the power rather than the torque. So it might have more torque early on. But um, that's not that's not always a consideration, or never really is really a consideration from the engineer's point of view from an ADR perspective. So yeah, it's uh, otherwise yeah, you're up for all sorts of costs and and um, upgrades. Um, yeah. And look, and there's just another question there from Lars saying, how is the rear diff handling the regen? Yeah, so so far yeah, it's pretty good. Um, I'm looking at. Yeah, you know, basically the, the diff and the gearbox were fairly unknown when I got the car because they were stock and it wasn't a, a runner. I mean, I, I ran it, I drove it around the block a couple of times the day I got it, but it it it, um, it conked out and I had to push it home. So uh, I realized then and there that I, I'm definitely going to convert this um, as soon as possible. But so far, so basically our philosophy was let's put it, the conversion in and then see what, uh, the brakes first or what can't handle the, the torque and will ease everything in so first the clutch died um the original clutch with the torque of the new motor that was fairly expected so we, we had hardly driven it around the workshop before we realized that the clutch would need upgrading so we got a high performance clutch so far the gearbox and the diff are still holding up uh after a couple of thousand kilometers of testing I'm still. I'm actually investigating some gearbox upgrades, um, just to be able to have a bit more confidence um, with it. But yeah, the the, re, the regen handled through the gearbox and in um, is is handling it fine so far. And, okay. and yeah, regards to clutch, yeah, there is a clutch. I decided to click clutch so that it would be yeah. more intuitive. For people yeah. Changing gears. yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we do as well. So interior here, fairly that's stock. Oh, look, sorry, mate. Yeah, go on. No, that's all right. It's it. I tried to keep it fairly stock. There's a under dash air conditioning unit. You'll see. Uh, this is before I added a very small uh, head unit into the radio single din spot there, and that um, has this Android screen which shows up some digital gauges that I can 
choose to look at or not. If I don't look, you know, if I don't, I don't need to look at them because I've got analog uh, fuel gauge, which is reading the battery state of charge and the speedometer and, and everything is, is controllable via the uh, analog system. But mm. yeah, you'll see a bit later, there's some digital gauges there that help to interrogate what's going on with the batteries, et cetera. And the, and the aircon is that powered by the, the, the traction pack or, or? No. Yeah, by the traction pack. So I've got a, a high voltage electric compressor, which yep. fits uh, in the, in the um, engine bay. And yeah, it's pretty economical. It only, it runs really, um, I can't remember the wattage right now, but it's very, very low. It doesn't, it, it's very economical. Yeah, okay, excellent. And does that do heat as well or just, just cooling? At the moment, just cooling, but we're investigating the heating as well um, as a possibility at the moment in Queensland. I don't need it for, for cooling. No, it's not really an issue, is it? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, cool. And I presume those are banded wheels, are they? Uh, they're actually new, re, uh, made in the UK, you know, from Retro Forward, which is make the new wider, uh, basically they're, seven inch wide um uh reproductions yeah nice yep yeah beautiful so uh range anxiety so the big design around mine is i've used five tesla modules which is about 28 kilowatt hours uh those modules are split between a battery box at the front and a battery box in the back which is sandwich right behind the back seat over the rear axle um i didn't want to take up the whole rear boot with batteries or lose any seating space or or anything like that and we didn't want to overload the engine bay with too much weight so i wanted to balance the bait the, the the battery packs um the you know the tesla modules are, are the best energy density modules out there for ev conversions but 28 kilowatt hours isn't a huge battery size, so it it gets about 160 kilometers or, or a bit more in range, and I wanted to have confidence that I could do more than that. So the the way and coming from a electric vehicle fast charging infrastructure planning background, it had to have DC fast charging. So uh, charter mode is the only easily um, easy protocol to, to incorporate into an EV classic car conversion at this stage. Uh, I'll maybe CCS2 will be an option soon. Uh, we're working on that if that's in the future, but at the moment, a charter mode is easier to configure. And so we're running, we're running a charter mode, a DC fast charging port, which is in the exhaust pipe, old exhaust pipe section, which you'll see in this picture. And yeah, it's the, awesome. The AC charging is is in the original fuel filler cap, uh, just to the right of the number plate there. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's awesome, uh, and uh, that's pretty rare, right? There's not many uh, home built EVs or you know aftermarket EVs that have ch have Chelemo. So pretty impressive, mate. Pretty impressive feat to do. Yeah, it's been it's been hard to get that over the line. Oh, you know to configured to work because there's been there's very little support uh, no one else has done it in australia no. we're running quite a low voltage so only 120 odd volts uh which is a bit unusual i guess for to be using these high powered uh, public fast chargers on such a low voltage help, um kit um but yeah we got it got it working eventually we're still sorting out some gremlins but it it works it, it goes well and it, it's mm. good to have that confidence nice. and the, the, the charging networks are just going to increase in. Uh, yeah. They're not going backwards. Right. Yeah. 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 No, it's perfect. Yeah. No, really good. Uh, so this is the hyper nine motor with its custom adapter plate uh, fitted. And that's what bolts directly to the uh, stock manual gearbox and yeah, no surgery. So trying to make everything bolt in, use existing bolt, um, you know, mounts and bolt holes, etc., and and don't don't cut anything um, too drastically. That was our sort of mantra with this. 
yeah yeah perfect and and that's a that that adapter replaced my but my by traction ev yeah that's right yeah yeah the was that custom of... was that custom for you or did they do that um um was that off the shelf no that's they've designed it for this gearbox and yeah now that it's been custom made they've, they've got the design there ready to go for, for another gearbox or comes in another project comes in you know they've got the designs there ready to go yeah that's great that's pretty good so i mean queensland as i've already mentioned it gets hot batteries don't like getting too hot and tesla batteries are, are plumbed for air cooling uh, water cooling so what we've we're running two separate um, water pumps and water circulation um, systems. This, this is one of them which um, circulates cooled water around the battery packs. Uh, they don't, the reservoir here is empty, this is before it was um, filled, but you can see in the, the picture of the battery pack in the boot with the lid off it on the top right, the left-hand side has the, some coolant tubes with the red coolant in it that you can see that the right hand side shows uh, the high voltage wiring but what I can you can see is that you know, the the coolant system is run and is on constantly and we've got temperature monitoring on all these cells throughout the Tesla battery packs and that's being monitored constantly um, by the BMS and and I can look at that uh, you know it, through the dash unit. Yeah, um, I, actually, I actually like how you got those, um, the cells vertically there as well. It looks, it looks really good. Yeah, that was just the best way to, to get it to be as unobtrusive as possible in the boot. So that slots in nicely over the rear axle and doesn't take up hardly any boot space really. Um, yeah. the, the other picture is that that large radiator there is actually the radiator for the air conditioning system. So there's, there's two other smaller radiators on either side of that, which are for the two coolant systems. The other coolant system keeps the motor controller cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. And look, look how many packs, again, how many packs you got in the front, how many in the rear? Three in the rear and two in the front. Yeah, not really good. Yeah. That must be pretty much 50-50 weight distribution, as we say in as, as it, it, the it next is. slide. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's a, it ended up being... Pretty much spot on 50 50 so that was that was great um what you'll see here is uh the hyper nine mounted to the to the stock gearbox everything coming off the original engine motor mount the that black um rectangular plate there is that's got the electric compressor sitting on it yeah okay yeah no it's really well done man really well done Yeah, and, and there's the, that, is that, is that is aluminium box, is it? Yeah, five mil aluminium. That's that's got two Tesla modules in it. They're sitting horizontally over the top of the uh, motor and the motor controller plate, which you can't see there. Okay. And so custom-made um, truss-type mounts to support that um, battery box, which go down to um, original you know, mounting positions. Can't quite make it out there, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's um, yeah, that's really well. That's really. I, I think there's uh, some. I know there's some car groups. They 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 aim to have this kind of clean look, so you can lift the bonnet, and there's no ancillaries. There's nothing bolted to the, you know, the firewall and all this kind of stuff. And you've managed to achieve that, uh, you know, very well either by design or by, <laughs> or, <laughs> or or by uh, by accident. But it's it's really well done. It looks it really adds to the build that the fact that you've got nothing really on view in terms of cleaning, you know, contactors or anything like that at all. It's really well done. Yeah, no, definitely. That's, that's traction EV and definitely by design to keep it looking nice and neat. And he, yeah, you know, you no, know, I, didn't, I didn't want a bird's nest when you open up the, the boot or the, or the, um, on it. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so some of the other things that we ended up, needing to to really take some time on to to solve uh, i've already mentioned that the charter mode charging was something that didn't work straight out of the box and and still required a lot of required an update firmware update to the bms uh, a lot of software 
uh, parameters to be uh, tweaked and retweaked and tuned. You know, we're still finding the best um, solution for that, but um, yeah, it, it can be done. Uh, and we're glad we, we got it done. We're still working on making it totally foolproof. Yeah. Um, the other big thing we had was getting the did all the gauges to work as I had envisaged. So getting the analog fuel gauge to work as a battery state of charge gauge wasn't wasn't as simple as what I was led to believe. But we you know, worked with a gauge shop here in Brisbane that custom made a, a voltmeter basically to to read zero to five volts, which is the analog output of the BMS, mm. um, and also getting the, the, the suite of digital gauges to read exactly what I wanted um, is, is, is still something that I'm finessing. But well, basically, I'm taking from the, OBD, from the BMS to an OBD2 connector, which is under the dash, just like any other modern car has an OBD2. Mm. And when I run from the OBD2, I run a talk app on an Android head unit, which... Wow. You know, which then reads all the outputs from the BMS. Um, yeah. No, really nice, man. Really nice. Making all that, making all that foolproof, so that you know, I have a vision that anyone could potentially hop in the car and be able to drive it sort of intuitively, either just looking at the analog controls, or if they want <clears throat> more detail, they can look at the digital gauges as well. Making it all foolproof is something that's still a challenge that I'm working through. Yeah, uh, look, it, and, and from, from in my experience, that that's what takes the time, I think, because if you if you've built the car and you're one with it, and then you know, you know, for example, what your state of charge is, because you know how far you've driven it, and you can do a quick calculation based on the things that you know, but ultimately you need anyone to be able to jump in it and to be able to drive it um, without them wondering how far you've got, how far they've got to go and all this kind of stuff. So that's the, that's the real skill in all of this. And like I've had the same issues or challenges with like the Audi and the Land Rovers as well in terms of getting the gauges to read properly. Um, so, so there's no, there's no mishaps in the middle of nowhere that you get you know, run out of battery when it, it says something different, obviously. So that is a challenge that, especially with some of these packs where, you know, it's the where when they discharge, it's not, it's not um, progressive. It'll be, it'll be fine, 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 and then it'll be empty basically. Yeah, uh, yeah. In terms of how the voltage curve will go, so that's what a lot of people don't understand as well. Yeah. Um, no, really, really good stuff. Uh, yeah. So I was asked to, to suggest some um, advice for anyone thinking of something like this um so some points that came to mind that were different from yours last week russ were when you're considering a candidate really do your homework on what on what the conversion would look like how it would work um how motors batteries everything could be uh, positioned within the car what would be affected by the modification because an engineer may look upon your uh, vision a bit differently and I've always trying to uh, minimize any um, disruptions or, or potential um, curly ones that the engineer might um, be concerned about. So a lot of different cars I thought about and looked at and what I'm still thinking about, um, the engineer may look at it totally differently. So just do, do homework on candidate um, selection um, and budget. Look, it can vary a lot depending on what you want to get out of it and also mm. what type of materials and where you get them from. Um, if you, you know, if you want to get a four or 500 kilometer range out of a converted EV, then yeah, you know, you're up for a lot of money and a really mm. difficult um, car that will, uh, sorry, a candidate that will be able to accommodate that, that, that amount of batteries. So, yeah, and, and just to, just to, to one of your earlier points, you know, in terms of choosing the conversion candidate, I mean, I, I can't say this enough. Actually, choose the go for the car you actually want to drive. That's so important. Um, not just anything that that you know is going cheap on Facebook Marketplace. Um, you got to enjoy to drive, want to drive it, even if it was you know an ice car. Essentially, it sounds obvious, but 
you know, you've got to have some sort of uh, affinity. If you're going to put that much hard work into it um, for it to, to um, you know, you might as well do have, have something that you've always wanted or you have dreams of driving or what have you. Yeah, definitely. I agree. And, and, look, and, and it's, on. yeah, it's just a, it's a fast moving field, which is great because you can, you can pick on what other guys are doing all around the world and, and mm. add to that. So that's another thing that is great to, uh, to be aware of is what what everyone else is doing around the world yeah and look i think that other point there is talk to the engineer early that's really important too so i know there's a couple of projects where they've come to us um customers have come to us and said hey, would you would you mind um you know uh, helping us with this or you know putting in touch with an engine engineer and i think what a lot of people don't understand is that um some engineers won't even touch a car or conversion if you've already started it so it's no point you're starting on on your conversion up front and then hoping someone's going to come along and sign it off. They they typically will want you to. One of their first questions will be, "Have you started on the project already?" And if the answer is yes, they'll pretty much put the phone down you there there and then. So it's definitely you know something to consider for sure is giving them find an engineer who is is in the field and can understand it and and um, and help you um, you know um, get the design right for the for the build. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. So this is a picture of the fuel tank, which we repurposed in the boot to house the high voltage equipment, BMS, uh, onboard charger, DC to DC and the high voltage junction box. Yeah, no, cool. So is that the, the, the fan on the, the thing with the fan on the right hand side, that's the charger, is it? Yeah, that's a combined uh, onboard charger and DC to DC converter in one unit. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, on the box on the left hand side? That's just high voltage junction box. We've got the Chartermo cables coming in on the from the underside or underside left. Um, yep. Okay. And, uh, and the what? What are the one with the fin? Sorry. That's the BMS. Bottom okay. Left. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Really well done. And that all just just closes with the fuel box lid there, and the uh, whole box has got some um, air cooling as well. But uh, yeah, it's, it keeps everything fairly neat. And if anything needs to be reversed back, all we need to do is buy a new uh, fuel tank. No other, you know, didn't need to met, put find any mounts or, or position all this equipment somewhere that where it didn't really belong. It just kind of sits there and the lid yeah. gets shut and that's it. Yeah, no, yeah, no, it's, it's a really neat installation. I like it. So what is, yeah, the, the, the big questions are, the big what, question, are the, yeah. what, are the, what are the stats and, um, and how much did it cost? So look, it's when, I, when people ask me this, I say, look, it's kind of, I'm still evolving everything kind of um, almost 99% finished, but basically think of a figure like around, for me, it was around 30 grand mark to do the conversion. Uh, the car itself, you know, they started off with was, was about 10 grand or, or so for the body mm. and a few other bits. So if you want, I went some high spec gear, others, uh, you know, managed to get by with something that was satisfactory. So, um, yeah, that's roughly the ballpark, you know, I added air conditioning, which was another, you know, couple of grand, I suppose on, on top of all that, but that that's the rough ballpark and the stats I think are on the, next slide of, of what I ended up with, which is the range of, of a, at least, you know, 160, maybe 180 Ks. Yep. The, the Hyper 9 motor, which is a three phase AC. Now uh, I'll, I'll just read this out. The Hyper 9 motor is a synchronous reluctance internal permanent magnet motor. And that gives out- That's a mouthful, man. Yeah, I always forget that. It's, R I P M. It's easy to say uh, AC induction motor, I find. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty powerful. The talk, you know, off the line is, is crazy and I'm still learning to control it, but I'm still ne never get sick of it. And I'm, I'm, you know, putting some video together of, of uh, how that trying to emulate how that feels mm. uh, when you're in the car to put it onto film to put on YouTube. But you know, it's very hard to emulate that feeling. But, yeah. Oh, I can say is any anyone that hops in when they experience it, you know, they 
their neck snaps backwards and then they laugh, you know, they just smile yeah. and the rest of the time. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's awesome. I, I love the screen that you got there as well, and obviously on your Android unit as well. That's really cool. That's really well done. Yeah, it, it's a very small screen. That's a very close-up picture of it, but um, it's just a six-inch or seven-inch tablet that belong that sticks to the the single DIN head unit, um, and I can you know have my stereo and the, and the maps or whatever if I need to, and, and then just switch to this, which is a talk app, which shows state of charge and amps and yeah. high high and low voltage of every cell high and low temperature of every cell, total pack voltage, um, yeah, a few other things. That, yeah, they're there when you need it. But like I say, I can switch that off and just drive with it and look at the, pet, um, the analog gauges if I need to. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've got a little, This none of the pictures show, there's a little selectable regen um, switch that's sort of, uh, just to the left of the steering column, I can switch between high, low, and zero region. And that's also where I switch between reverse, neutral, and forward with a little red missile switch. <laughs> so uh, forward is down, and to flick it into reverse, you just got to you know, take the cover off the switch so you don't accidentally switch it into reverse. Um, and yeah, I never use reverse on the gear stick now. Uh, it's a lot easier just to flick it into reverse. Um, yeah, and, and that's actually what we're doing with the Land Rover. Obviously, the the initial, you know, version zero point one is you know the, you've got the, the gearbox and you select you select reverse, but you know the the reverse when you select it, you need really long arms to select it because it's somewhere over in the right hand wheel or something. You know, it's just, it's just crazy the amount of tra travel is on the on on the on the gear stick. So. Um, we're going to actually have DN and R on the on the Land Rovers eventually. We'll have not that doesn't mean do not resuscitate, obviously. Um, you, know, <laughs> you know, drive neutral and reverse, um, because once you've had that, to be able to just flick to go into reverse or go into forward is you know, why would you use a why would you use a gear stick after that, really? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the stats basically. Um, a charged garage is something that I, uh, a concept that I that came to me while working on this Cortina is that what I wanted when I started it was a classic car without the hassle. And I thought maybe some other people do too. Um, that just want to enjoy the driving and not have to worry about maintaining. And I want it to be fun to drive and reliable and, and easy uh, without all the tinkering. So I came up with a concept I'm still working on how it's going to actually evolve, but basically it's about uh, sharing classic cars because once you've got one, you don't necessarily need to drive it all day, 24 seven, unless it's your daily, which is great. But um, for me, this is not uh, our only car, it's the, the second car. So I'm happy to share it with other people, but that wouldn't work on a, on a ice car, I don't think, a nice classic car anyway, which usually needs a lot of coddling and and maintenance whereas if it's electric it should be uh open to being utilized more and and for racking up kilometers and for it to be fairly foolproof so i'm um, uh yeah toying with this concept i'd be happy to talk about it with anyone who's interested i'm doing cars you know, the vision of having multiple owners maybe even renting them out for people to sort of pre-packaged uh Mm. Casual rentals to you know in combination with accommodation providers or, or something uh, along these lines and yeah it's just a concept I'm working on so head yeah. along to, yeah to, I, I think it's a cracking idea definitely we just need more people to to do and obviously there's about 75 on the on the on the call at the moment you might end up with 75 cars in the next few months all being converted ready to sign up sounds great um, and so what's happening next well I've got a a, a combi and Unlike Russ, you and Jaunt, which is all about repeatability and, and standardizing and doing the first one and then repeating it, which is a very smart business move. <laughs> I'm going with the opposite, which is about pushing the boundaries and going a whole lot harder and wider and faster and, and upping the ante. So this time we're, we're putting a, a full Tesla motor swap, uh, direct drive, no gearbox, a full Tesla pack, um, to get a big range, higher voltage pack means higher voltage DC charging, um, 
And yeah, fortunately in a combi, you've got the space and the weight carrying capacity to, to do that, um, which, is a, which is one of the great things about them. And yeah, we're about to kick that off very soon. So, so follow it. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I can't wait to see that. Um, that will be really a full, a full Tesla pack. That's that's a crazy amount of power. That's so good. Um, and um, look, three hundred k's. Yeah, I reckon you'll probably get more out of that than than that. To be honest with you, as well. So I think you're going to do you're going to do do really well with that for sure. Okay, so that's that's all I had, Russ. Should we? Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Can you see the questions, Tim? Uh, in the Q and A, let me bring. Yeah, Q and A, Q and A, Q and A. Yeah, let's go. I know we answered some of these as we went through. Like you. So Ali Alami, uh, once you once you have all the equipments for conversion, what do you connect first? Battery to junction box, or fuse? And and it's. Um, Obviously, he's, he's, he's talking about safety, how, how you do it, I guess. Um, do you want to go first on that, Tim? How you, oh, how you, you, do can, you can go, Russ. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, what, what we do, so we build the packs off the vehicle and then we connect and we, we then install them and then we connect them up, essentially. But what we do to reduce... The, the problem with the packs is as you build them, the, the voltage increases, increases, increases to the point where it gets really dangerous. Um, so what we actually do is we connect the packs from, from either end um, together and build them up um, such that they're always in halves, if you know what I mean. And then when we're ready to connect, then we'll put the two you know that the last two links connecting uh, will instead of it being two halves of batteries, we connect them, but both we connect everything together. I've not answered that very correctly, very correctly, but rather than building all the voltage up, we basically split it in halves, and then when we're ready, we'll connect the last link, and then that means you're not dealing with instead of dealing with 140 volts, you're only dealing with 70 volts or 35 as you build the packs together. In terms of the actual startup sequence the controller actually deals with that for you so once you've connected once everything's connected up certainly um with the curtis controllers they're very 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 smart and they'll tell you when it's right to connect and if everything's okay obviously the design in the background is, is really important to make sure you're not um you know everything's correctly rated um and nothing is, is overloaded but there's I mean, there's a, probably a seminar just in just in that in terms of the design, to be honest with you. But basically, um, you connect them up in sections to make sure you nothing's you don't make a mistake as you as you're going through. It, essentially, um, hope that's made some sense. It probably doesn't, but happy to talk later about that as well. Um, Beth Williamson, I'd like to catch you with a touch with anyone in Melbourne who's done a conversion. No problem, Ali. No problem. Um, so like the best thing to do is talk to AVA or if you're in Melbourne, give me a call at Evolution and uh, I can put you, put you in touch with a couple of engineers who can help you out with that. Um, that's no problem at all. Um, Phil Gower, where do you find these wrecked Teslas? Tim, would you like to answer yeah, that? Yeah, so just they pop up after at the auction houses with you know the insurance companies write them off from accidents and flooding and hail damage, you know, they pop up every now and again. Just got to keep your eye out. It's a bit yeah. competitive now. So. Yeah, I, one thing I'd add to that is the the prices vary widely. Yeah. So, so it doesn't matter. I mean, and obviously you said you said you paid twenty grand for yours, but I know I've seen them go for like thirty five, forty for a wrecked yeah. Tesla. So yeah, so I've got I've got another one now. Uh, it's a one hundred D, and that was a lot, uh, a fair bit more. You know, twenty eight mm. grand or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you, if you're talking, you know, you, this is the problem that we've had with with joining. Obviously, there was a desire to use Tesla cells, but the problem we've got is we can't, we can't just, we've got to give a quote to to the customer, and we couldn't possibly say to them, oh, by the way, it's now, you know, fifty percent more because something went over, (laughs) someone went mental at the at the auction. Yeah. Um, So it's it's a bit. 
you've got to, I guess, bide your time. But you can um, also buy, yeah, sometimes there's secondhand or Tesla modules that are being sold by people correct. that are buying them for some for another purpose. So yeah, just keep an ear out. Uh, yeah, yeah. Overseas or locally. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and there's a, there's a they're commodity item, so they can be bought. They can be bought fairly, fairly easily. Um, uh, and Matthew Lamb, have you had to repair any of the battery fuses? No, we, I haven't. No, no, no. Um, are you looking at that? So that's a question to that's an answer question to a question. I think Jeff, are you looking to converting a car to EV? But I would love to con explore converting a J e type Jag to electric. All of us would. I would love to convert an E type Jag to electric. That's an awesome thing to do because obviously being British, it's an awesome body on it, but it leaks all the time I would imagine um, yeah and Graham Barton give us a call happy to have a chat give us a call on the 1300 number evolution and we'll uh, we'll give you a uh, we'll give you a call um, um, thanks Brad that's funny um, uh, yeah and look, and look yeah, give, give us a call when you're ready and, and we'll have we'll, we'll talk to you about uh, VAS certification and, and what we can do to help you with that um, Ian Marston, yep, there's a clutch between the motor and gearbox, and we would recommend that for sure. Um, Cameron McGregor, any applicable ADR rules to adhere to? Tim, do you want to take that yeah, one? Yeah, so NCOP 14, which is a guidance uh, that's been put out, you can find it on the net. NCOP 14, that's the, the one that the engineer in Queensland. Uh, Oh, I think it's nationwide that that guideline that the your engineer yeah, it is, it is. will uh, need to do a checklist based on that. Yeah, and it's a, it's actually pretty good because if you go, um, uh, if you go into the if you just do a search NCOP fourteen and and have a look, there's I don't know, there's about uh, twelve pages and about forty things you've got to adhere to, yep. and the engineer will go through every single one and make sure you've you've. Uh, met those met those requirements. It's things like you know the battery pack's got to withstand 20g forward movement and 5g lateral movement and all this kind of stuff. So um, there's a whole lot of stuff in there, uh, yeah. and and he will most engineers will go through and check all of that uh, in the minute minute detail to make sure that all the requirements have been met. Um, right. Lots of questions here to get through in three minutes. I know, I know, down. I know, I know. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer a couple of them quickly. Um, yeah. So the clutch we've answered, the regenerative braking we've talked about that comes That's, through. It the, comes by default, yeah. Yep. Um, uh, I use your original. Um, so new new pedal, you know, drive by wire. I think I took one out of a Tesla or a Mitsubishi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, aircon. It's electric. It's all from the you know, main traction battery. Uh, are you using electric demister? Yeah, so I've just used from the electric air conditioning just a little bit of a um, diversion of, of the air from the air con straight up to the windscreen, which is fine. Yeah. Um, DC fast charging, any hot day issues? Hot day issues, no. So even in the hottest, hottest day, doing some fast charging, the temperatures haven't maxed beyond sort of mid 40 degrees Celsius. That's pretty which good. Yep. which those Tesla cells are pretty comfortable with that. So, uh, yep, no problems with that. Yeah. Um, we've talked about Toby Roberts. We've talked about budget, obviously, from Tim's perspective, it was around 30 grand. Um, you, you know, your, your results may vary as will your budget and people spend a lot more than that and sometimes a lot less. But 30 to 40 is kind of the, 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 the average of for these kind of things we find anyway. Um, BMS is a... It's a battery management system. So that will make sure all your cells are happy at the right temperature and it will talk to your charger and talk to your controller and make sure that um, they never go over voltage and they're all broadly the same. Um, and again, there's a whole you know, discipline on how, how those kind of works and lots of different models and coding to do to get that working. Um, Tom Barton, I'll take that quickly. Um, under 10K, you would struggle. To, to do a conversion to be quite frank the, the motor kits alone are around 7k thereabouts and probably a bit more now the us dollars you know strong and the aud is on its ass basically so um 
like I said, you, you're talking parts alone about seven to 10 grand for the motor kit and then probably around, you know, 10 to 15 for, um, uh, uh, for the, for the, for the battery pack to be reasonable anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, different levels of regen. Yep. Let's talk about yeah, that. Let's talk about that. A average consumption is yeah. About six, 15, 16, um, kilowatt hours per hundred kilometers. And that's, yep. I can track that. Yep. Yep. Um, combi CCS two. I would like to do CCS two, but at the moment, uh, it's, I'm just going to do charter mode again since I know how it works and it's got it working. Um, how much weight is in the Cortina batteries? They're about 30 odd kilos each and I've got mm. five of them. So about 150 kilos. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so model S versus model X, there's no real difference in terms of the no. packs and all that kind of thing. You're going to get out of it, you know, pretty much the same results in terms of the yep. battery density, etc. cetera. Uh, can you uh, convert Land Rover Discovery? Come and talk to us. We'll help you with that. Uh, and look, in terms of original drive train, that's probably the easiest or the quickest route to do that. Um, but at the same time, um, you, you know, it's a, that gearbox in the Discovery is bloody heavy. Um, and we're doing a, like I said, we're doing a Range Rover two door Range Rover classic. And, um, we probably won't leave the gearbox in there because it's just, it's a proper boat anchor. So I will probably go direct drive, um, on that one. Uh, and we'll get additional torque, etc. Um, BMS. Yeah. It's an Orion BMS. Yep. Yeah. Really good. And we use that. We, we use Thunderstruck for everything just simply because like I said last week, we are able to do, um, you know, it's, it, it will integrate with everything um, from a canvas perspective. It just makes it really easy from our point of view. But when we may look at Orion down the track and I may pick your brains, uh, Tim, when it comes to that. Um, and Zabo, can you do my discovery? Go for it, mate. Um, Range Rover is a, a potentially a better option um, as it has independent suspension. Yep, potentially, but it won't make that much of a difference, to be honest with you. It's just if you've already got the discovery and you like it and it's in good nick, then you know what, convert it, um, you know, so, um, it's just down to what you want. Again, it's down to what you want to drive. Um, and, um, is it going to add to the value of the vehicle and maybe the classic Range Rover might be better, but you know, again, it's, uh, it's down to what you fancy, I guess, really. Um, yeah, I think, I think one more, are we doing another zoom this next week? I think we are actually, I need to check. I think we're going to have, um, uh, yeah, Fiat, oh, right. Fiat 500 conversion. How good is that going to be? So we're going to do that next week. And I've actually driven this car. It's absolutely awesome. So, um, yeah, so we'll get into that next week. Uh, same time, 7 o'clock. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do it all over again. Great. Thanks, Russ, for organizing. No, no. Thank, uh, thank you. And obviously, behind the scenes is Emma, who's um, um, my business partner, and she's put all these slides together and helped us all organize everything. So thanks to them. And look, thanks to everyone as well for joining. And, and um, I really appreciate you guys make it. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's really to have so much interest and, uh, and, and we wouldn't do it otherwise if there was no interest. So really appreciate that. And yet we'll send out the link shortly and uh, we'll get all that organized for you as well. All right. Excellent. Great. Thanks, Take guys. Care, everyone. Thanks, Thanks so. you very much indeed. And uh, I've recorded this as well. So um, it'll be up on, on our uh, YouTube channel shortly as well for, uh, for posterity. All right. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tim. And uh, let's see you next talk next week. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. See Bye. You later. Bye.